Oh, you're muted. Check one, check two, check three, check four, like this and like that and like this and uh, and like this and like that and like this and uh. Here we go, yo. Here we go, yo. So what? So what? So what's the scenario? 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 Hope that's broadcast. <laughs> I know, me too. I mean, it's part of my talk, so <laughs> it's just practice. Okay, I don't know how you're going to know when to scroll. I'm just telling you to scroll. <laughs> I can't really see. Any, anyway. I'll be like, scroll now. Yeah. I have little carrots, uh, little carrots on my page. So, oh, nice. okay. yeah. Go ahead, start it up. Right. Looks like we got some sponsorships in here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is there a specific place they want me to go? No, you can start with this. All right. Yeah. Then I'm just going to mention them. So you can scroll down when I mention them. Are we rolling? Oh, yeah, I guess we're rolling. Okay, Poso, everybody. The Tanaway Machinuk, my family, my friends, uh, people in the blogosphere. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, apologize for the late start. We had a bit of a little uh, digital technology uh static with the analog technology presentation I'm about to give you guys. I'm going old school paper. So my name is Justin Gothier. And uh, today we're going to talk about writing comic books. So I'm a newbie at this. So I'm going to te basically teach you guys what I've learned so far in this process. Um, I wanted to make sure to give a shout out to our grantee, our funder, the American Indian College Fund and the community-based Native Arts Learning and Sharing Grant that we were awarded. Um, thank you so much for that funding. And I wanna make sure to uh, give thanks and praise to my alma mater, the College of Menominee Nation um, and our new president, uh, Christopher Caldwell. And nested within that, is the amazing Sustainable Development Institute. And I wanted to give a shout out to Rebecca Edler, who's in attendance today. And um, the, the amazing grant writer, Emma Ardington, who helped us get the funding for this. And my brother in arms and partner in crime, Nicholas Schweitzer, who's gonna be the, art, uh, the artist for the comic book uh, project that we started. So I wanted to talk a bit about just the foundation of this, of this grant and the idea I was approached uh, for being the lead writer for a comic book that would promote the Menominee theoretical model of sustainability. As you can see here, it, it's uh, um, featured on the TV there. Um, I'm not gonna get too deep into the different facets of this icon. Um, someone else, another, uh, College of Menominee alumni, Jasmine Niosh, did a really succinct job of talking about it on a YouTube video. So I'm gonna ask Nick if he can just throw a link in the doobly-doo down in the comments for you to check it out later if you'd like. She does such a great job of um, uh, explicating what it is, what it's used for, all of its uh, different facets. She gets deep into that. so. Um, that'll be available in the comment section for you guys if you want to check it out later. But we're here to talk a bit about writing comic books. So let's get into that. I want to first introduce myself. I'm from, I'm a member of the Menominee Nation, a citizen of Menominee Nation. I was born and raised here on uh, Rabbit Ridge and Round Lake, uh, respectively. And uh, I'm a I'm a bicentennial baby. So I was born in 1976, I just turned 45. And um, uh, so I grew up in the early eighties here on the reservation. And I wanna talk a bit to ramp up into uh, the um, 
the, the sort of nuts and bolts part of the talk. I want to talk a bit about the advent of technology in the early 80s and what that meant to uh, my generation coming up, uh, Generation X, you know. So I want to start first with the Atari 2600. Um, a lot of people my age, younger and older, right around my age, remember the advent of the Atari 2600 being in people's homes. Now, I feel like uh, that video game system was sort of Trojan horsed into people's living rooms. You know, they didn't realize, they thought it was like a fancy board game or something that they could do with their kids to keep their kids busy. Really what it was, was a delivery device for, you know, entertainment and content. And we didn't realize that at the time because it was just Pong, like Pong had been out. And uh, so Atari was sort of the foundation of this, uh, the start of this movement, um, this sort of technological wave that we all got swept up in all across the nation, including here in the Menominee Nation. Now, Atari was great. I thought it couldn't get any better than Atari, you know, these blocks moving around the screen. Uh, this is it, this is the height of technology. Three years later, my dad went and rented a VCR from the store gas station in Shano. That was like new technology at the time. And it came in like a giant briefcase like this, like you see here. So we carried it in and it was back in the day when you had to screw in a fork into the back of your TV on a screw in the UHF. Um, uh, section and then you would pick between channels three and four this is super old school stuff but it it's all apropos for where i'm going with this but this this device this technology brought such a huge view of the world to me because i had never been anywhere really other than green bay wisconsin and it was sort of a, a smaller big city at that time so the VHS technology was sort of like drawing back the curtain on the wider world for me. And our first rentals were the movie Baby, which was about a baby dinosaur and The Breakfast Club. So you would figure a kid would love a story about a baby dinosaur, but actually I was more into The Breakfast Club, you know, uh, John Hughes is a genius. But um, yeah, so we go from Atari to VHS. All of these things are sort of retail price to be afforded by like middle class and somewhat lower class income families to be a part of your life now. And this is 19, early 1980s. 1984 is when the Nintendo Entertainment System came out. And I feel like this is where my generation sort of rocketed past my parents' generation because I can remember my parents attempting to play Mario Brothers with me and they would actually move the controller when they pressed to jump. So that was some sort, there was some sort of disconnect there with, with the technology as I was using it versus how they perceived the technology. So all this being said, it was the introduction of all this content, all this pop culture content that would influence our little community here on Menominee Nation forward. Now, what does this all mean for us? What it meant for us is that we were privy then to different stories and different ways of storytelling. Uh, I'm gonna get a little bit into particle physics right now, nothing too heavy, but uh, there's the concept of the arrow of time and the fact that time moves in a forward direction and we move with time forward. We can't go back in time and we can't travel back to a specific point in time yet. That may happen in the future. However, this concept of the arrow of time always keeps us moving forward and learning new things and experiencing new things. But I propose that when you utilize former technologies, more analog technologies like books, comic books especially in this instance, uh, television and radio, it's like drawing back that arrow of time for it to be propelled forward um, in your experience with content. So all this being said, I fell in love with storytelling early on and I had all these different avenues to experience content and stories and narratives that people had created. It was very overwhelming at the time and I didn't think that 
uh, it would lead to anything other than just entertainment for me. But I did fall in love with storytelling and it started in the movie Blade Runner uh, in 1982. My parents took me to see Blade Runner um, at a movie theater in Milwaukee um, as we were down there visiting family. And as I said before, like the biggest city I'd ever been in was Green Bay. So it was very much a shocking, like a culture shock trip for me to go to Milwaukee, this big metropolitan city, be brought to this movie. And of course, you know, at, in 1982, I was six years old. So I probably fell asleep at like the 12 minute mark, you know, but within those 12 minutes was the spinner scene where Edward James Olmos is the driver and Harrison Ford is the passenger eating a cup of noodles. They fly through downtown future Los Angeles, fly past a skyscraper with a geisha on it. There were this amazing soundtrack by Vangelis was like perking in my ears. My visual senses were so locked into all these colors and lights that I had never seen before. And my touch, you know, all my senses were sort of engaged. My touch, I remember being on the edge of my seat and having my arms up on the sides and my parents being on the side. There was all this memory locked into this one scene. I fell asleep at the end of the movie. My parents woke me up, put me in the car and we were driving through downtown Milwaukee. And I swore to God, we were still in the future, you know, because I had never been in a big city before. So I've seen all these, you know, uh, traffic lights, you know, floodlights on buildings, street lights. It, it just sort of was a carryover from that experience for me. And I remember being in the theater and wanting to reach out through that screen and be in that world. So I fell in love with the idea of if someone can do this, how do I become a part of that? And how do I become a storyteller that can tell stories like that? I always talk with my friends, getting to know them about what was your first movie theater experience, you know? Um, and I'm sure just within the room here, there, there's some really interesting stories about the first movie that you guys remember going to see and, and the viewers at home, I'm sure you have your own memory of that. And I, for a long time, I labored under the idea that the uh, Blade Runner was the first movie I'd ever seen in the theaters. But as I got older and started reviewing my childhood, I remember going to the premiere of Windwalker in Shano, downtown Shano, Wisconsin at the Crescent Theater, I believe it was called. It was a fall, like a crisp fall night and I remember being in line with a bunch of Menominee people going in to see this movie about indigenous people. Of course, looking back, that was 1980, so I was four years old. But like looking back at that content at that time, it was, um, it was sort of one step ahead from the Hollywood Indian portrayal that had been happening up to that time. It, it wasn't a quantum leap forward the way that we see now with like uh, Reservation Dogs, Rutherford Falls, the sort of contemporary things that are happening and, and that are uh, in the hopper to happen. But Windwalker was sort of a, a uh, you know, a bookend for me because it was the first movie memory that I have. And I remember being so scared of the villain in their bad face that it made a big impression on me. So there, there were all these things happening in the early eighties happening to me that I started falling in love with the idea of becoming a storyteller and writing and writing because I walked around with a speak and spell. And if a lot of people like speak and spells are at target again. So all the parents in this room, buy your kid a speak and spell because they're amazing. And at home, buy your kid a speak and spell because it, it was a very early version of a tablet. Now I feel like the tablet today, like the tablets that exist now are sort of a view into the internet, which, you know, you can put parental controls on it. As a kid myself, um, you know, in the early 80s, there weren't really, the only parental control was if your parents were hovering over you, telling you not to watch this, not to listen to this. Otherwise, you could sneak off to your room and listen to the Rolling Stones or, you know, go to your cousin's house and, and watch The Shining at five years old. It was totally not cool, not cool stuff for kids to be watching. But um, yeah, the speak and spell is sort of a, an early version of um, a tablet for me because I learned how to spell and I learned how words worked 
when you put them together. So speak and spell is another uh, version of technology that really influenced me. Um, so that sort of got me into writing. You know, I, I created uh, little stories in my mind and, um, and it got me into writing. So I sort of went through life and when I became an adult returning student to school, I came to College of Menominee Nation and was really encouraged and inspired by the teachers here and, and some of my friends that came here to write and to get into storytelling even more. Because through my 20s, I had written really bad romantic poetry. I think some of us have probably done that in this room. But like uh, looking back on it now, I was like, man, I couldn't even sell this to Hallmark. You know, this is really bad stuff. But um, I got into storytelling. So uh, at CMN was sort of the, the seed for that. And, and it was really nurtured here, the idea that I could do something with my writing. So I thank all my teachers and mentors here. Uh, I went from CMN to UW-Madison and got into the um, creative writing department there um, and graduated with a bachelor in arts and creative writing, emphasis on creative writing. And then thanks to the um, librarians here at CMN, I was alerted to the low res program at the Institute for American Indian Arts. It was a two year uh, master of fine arts program. So I applied to that, got into that, and was my, my eyes were turned to screenplays. And it was like the marriage of these two things that have been so important in my life, media content, television, movies, video games, and the written word. So there were actually, you know, of course I knew that there were screenplays, but I had never sat down and read one. I sat down and had to read for my master's program X number of screenplays. But every time I sat down and read one, I could see the movie in my mind. So I thought, okay, this is something that I have an aptitude for and that I can pursue as a career. So that's a whole other talk. But moving on to one of my mentors as a kid, Stan Lee, Stan the Man Lee, who, who we, we just celebrated his passing a few days ago. Um, He's been gone three years now, but he was omnipresent in Marvel comics as a kid. He was all over those comics, including his name in the little boxes in the beginning, president, edited by, written by. Um, and this quote by Stan Lee really resonates with me to this day. The only advice anybody can give is if you wanna be a writer, keep writing and read all you can, read everything. So I don't know if you guys, like sit at the breakfast table and read the back of cereal boxes or you did that as a kid, like turn it on. The, there's more stuff, even on the side, read the nutrition facts, read everything you can because um, uh, everyone writes for an audience. So everything that you see in the world has been tailored to be taken in by your eyes. So be sure to read, pay respect to writers because, um, because writers need respect too. Now, I realized that um, some people just don't have that connection in their mind where the words on the page don't create images in their mind. So I wanna uh, be sure to talk about, you know, that sort of, um, that sort of experience for people too. The advent of technology that I've been talking about can help those people as well with the, um, with the proliferation of podcasting and audio books. There's no reason to be shut out from content anymore. You just have to be willing to ingest it in different ways or a way that's comfortable for you. So read everything you can, listen to everything you can. It just makes you a better citizen in the world. Is, is what I'll say. So moving on, there's a, a splay of comic book covers here. And another quote, comic books to me are fairy tales for grownups by Stan Lee. Um, makes sense to me because I feel like fairy tales are very foundational things. 
as an indigenous person, I was told teaching stories as a kid from both my Ho-Chunk um, grandmother and also from my Menominee grandfather. I was told sort of teaching stories, but those fall into the same category, I feel like, as like Renard the Fox stories or any sort of like historical story that's meant to teach. And it also uh, influences the way that you interact in the world. So comic books to me are fairy tales for grownups. Now, comic books are this beautiful um, marriage, once again, of like the visual and the textual that you can hold in your hand. So it hits on a different level when, when you're experiencing a story that you can see and your eye moves. In the sequential arts, your eye moves across the page much quicker than if you're reading a novel. Novel is more like scansion, like your eyes are scanning along. But the, the sequential arts keep your eye moving and you're looking at things within a frame, within the panels, and then your mind is putting together what's happening between those panels. So that's what we're sort of gonna drill down on here is what is happening between those panels that our eyes are taking in. So it's like an open eye on a panel. It's like a closed eye between the panel. Your mind, your imagination is filling in the blanks on some of these stories. And then your eye opens back up to the next panel. Um, so what does a good comic book story include? Of course, you could, any one of us in here could populate this list because it's, it's really subjective to what, what you enjoy. What does a good comic book story include? From one person to the next, it could be something different, but I've sort of tried to grab these three points, a compelling story with relatable characters. There's a reason that, you know, Marvel comics and DC, I don't wanna diss DC, because I know there's a lot of DC people out there and I love DC, I'm a huge Green Lantern fan. So um, love a lot of love to DC too, but um, I'm gonna use uh, Spider-Man as the example for these, uh, these comic book story examples I have here, a compelling story with relatable characters. As a kid for me, like Peter Parker was super relatable. I was such a nerd um, as a kid and Peter Parker just as his alter ego, Peter Parker, just the fact that he was a science nerd and he had all of these problems in his life. Like he had Gwen, problems with Gwen Stacy, he had dating problems. He was living with his elderly widowed aunt. You know, that's a challenge in itself if anyone is in that situation. Uh, I mean, he's dealing with the death, the recent death of his uncle, who was like his father figure. And also he has the death of his parents in his childhood. So there's so much, um, adversity that Peter Parker has to overcome. So the compelling part of that, I feel like, is that it's totally relatable for all of us to think about, you know, people that we've lost in our past, situations that we've been in, uh, being lovelorn, you know, um, being rejected by people, all that stuff. A compelling story with relatable characters is Peter Parker. Now the relatable side of it, also on the other side, with his uh, superhero identity as Spider-Man, all of us can relate to that as well. Because in our everyday life, we all run into issues that it feels like are too big to surmount. This is too much for me to handle. And, and if, you, if you break it down to its component parts, it's usually just getting started. Like we gotta start by this, we gotta do this next step. So even, even Spider-Man dealing with the Green Goblin you know, pumpkin bombing Times Square, it starts with him putting the suit on and then swinging in. And that's the catalyst part that I'm talking about here, a catalyst to set the story in motion. There's, there's multiple stories going on in a, in a especially in, an, in the amazing Spider-Man run. Um, but in, in pretty much every iteration of Spider-Man, you have like the Peter Parker issues and the Spider-Man issues and they're either totally separated or they're totally, they come together in the end. So the catalyst is usually a villain, but also it can be MJ shooting him down for a day. You know? So there's so many foot and hand holds for us as readers to get into you know, Peter Parker's world and Spider-Man's world. So I'm gonna do a quick plug here in arresting and captain, captivating visuals, excuse me, for my partner in crime, Nicholas Schweitzer. December 3rd, come back. 
and watch this amazing artist explain to you the visual arts, the sequential visual arts that he is so talented with. So I hope that you come back on December 3rd. Um, but that being said, arrest, arresting and captivating visuals are super important to keep our, to keep our eye moving and to keep us scanning across that page sequentially and to keep our mind engaged to fill in what's going on between those panels. Now, as an indigenous person, um, I wanted to talk a bit about winter counts. If you're not familiar with winter counts, these are uh, historical uh, preserving history basically through story. Um, as I was doing the research to get into becoming a comic book writer, uh, I watched several uh, TED Talks and read a lot of articles by people in the industry. And there was a lot of mention of like hieroglyph, hieroglyphs in Egyptian history. Um, and there was a lot of talk about like the sequential arts in the Trajan Column in Rome, how basically battles were portrayed spiraling up a column visually and how sequentially um, Egyptologists figured out that stories were told sequentially in uh, hieroglyphics. But there was no mention of the indigenous people of Turtle Island. So years ago, thanks to SDI, uh, I, I went to a museum and saw my first winter count. And it just fascinated me, the fact that someone was picked out by the elders of this tribe to be an artist and to chronicle a full year of events on you know, a brain tanned hide, uh, buffalo hide. So here we see lone dogs, uh, Lone Dog's winter count. Um, and as you can see, the iconography starts in the center and it spirals out. So the idea is that Lone Dog could sit down with the, the children, the elders, everyone in the community, and basically tell the story of the year from winter to winter and include you know, all characters from the community. And if you look in there, you can see that there are a lot of recognizable little icons. There's a, some gardening tools in there. There's teepees, there's horses, there's people, you know, there's activity going on. There's different color, there, there's like black, white, and red. So there's like motion going on, there's colors, and then there's the auditory storytelling. So as indigenous people, we're no strangers to sequential storytelling. Of course, this is an example of Plains Indians using that technology. I would, I would argue that Woodland Indians have their own version of this in our regalia and also in our everyday wear, in the fact that we use um, plant imagery, seed imagery, animal imagery everywhere. So that someone could be walking around with a story on their body that they're willing to share. With, with their family and friends. So iconography in storytelling is old as the hills, as they say. And indigenous people were right on top of that too. Let's get into the nuts and bolts, guys. Plot first and screenplay. I'm gonna talk about plot first scripting because it's basically the tactic that Stan, Stan Lee used, right? Uh, Stan the man Lee. Like uh, I'm sure that it comes from a more ancient tradition, but the way that he used it in um, the Marvel method, I think if you could scroll down below the, our plot first page, the Marvel method spot there, really simple document, the Marvel method lists out page and panel. It's descriptive and progressive in the way that it moves the story forward. And Stan Lee would leave out the dialogue for his version because he's super busy, right? I mean, this guy's running the Fantastic Four, the Incredible Hulk and Spider-Man all at once while doing interviews. I mean, I'm surprised he had a, a chance to even write. So uh, I wanted to show an example of one of our pages that we've been using. So here we go, yo, here we go, yo. So what, so what, so what's the scenario? And I'm gonna check the box on my tribe called Quest Quote for the day. So our scenario that we're dealing with here is about Barry, a field agent for a biotech company called Maniquestra, who's surveying a test plot. Um, so the page that we're using, we're, we're using the, the plot first style because it's a really succinct way for me as a writer to get across really descriptive scene work to Nicholas as the, the artist. 
and also to imagine in my own mind what a page would look like. Now we have page 11, the test plot that gives the setting. And then we, we have underlined panels underneath panel one through six. I want later on, I'm gonna emphasize the collaborative, um, the, the importance of collaboration that's been going on between Nicholas and I, but really these are just placeholders, panel one through six. If Nicholas envisions it as panels one through nine, if he can do it in five panels, I'm gonna trust his vision as the artist to be able to get across what's on this page. So panel, basically I'm gonna talk a bit about what this document looks like. So bracketed at the top here, I have landscape. So I'm breaking the cardinal rule of the screenwriter right off the bat. I'm directing the director where to put the camera, you know? Um, but Nicholas and I have a great working relationship. So. Um, I'm just giving him an idea of what I envision as the writer. This is a landscape that we're looking at. And the test plot consists of many rows of young thigh-high corn plants. All are thriving. And then we have Barry's speech. Uh, we guarantee vigor and well, looks vigorous to me. How do you feel about it? Moving on to panel two. You'll notice this is a pretty chunky panel, panel two here. It's a pretty big, um, pretty big bit of text here. However, really the, the gist of it is in the first two really short sentences. Farmer squints, Barry pockets his phone. Basically the, the nature of the panel is given away just in that imagery. Barry's trying to get the farmer to be comfortable with the idea that he's a test plot for this seed company and the farmer is basically not having it. But as you can see in there, in the chunk, we have farmer speech one, berry speech two, farmer speech three, berry speech four. So we have an example of back and forth dialogue, this ping pong back and forth idea that happens quite a bit in, in uh, screenwriting. Um, but basically, like I said, in those first two short sentences, we capture what is going on in this dialogue as well. So then I wanted to not give any spoilers for our story, but page, 12 and 13, Nicholas and I really want to play with the format of the comic book. And we have some novel ideas for how to do that. So this, these two here are just sort of like Easter egg stuff for you guys to see. In our workflow, we're trying to, we're trying to um, actually play with motion and having our readers flip the book and having and looking at it in different perspectives and things like that. So this has been our workflow working together really simple plot first scripting document here. And if you can imagine, um, it's pretty simple really. And you can get across really, um, you know, really elegant ideas and concepts in a few sentences. And the collaborative method is super important for this. So that's the plot first that we've been using. I'm gonna move down to the screenplay page. So I took this same, scenario and wrote it out as a screenplay page. So they say like every screenplay page is one minute and that usually works out to be true. But I wanted to point out just sort of the similarities between these two documents. Uh, starting in the beginning, this is the Warner Brothers format, which is sort of like a generic screenplay page. A lot of people, like if you were to download a PDF online of random movie, Blade, Trinity, uh, you would see that they probably more than likely use this format. So EXT exterior manaquestra test plot that gives us our setting where we're at day, time of the time of day that we're in. Thigh high corn plants in neat rows, berry 30s, a not too bright field agent snaps a smartphone picture. The farmer 50s stands back at a distance, not engaged. We guarantee bigger. So that whole little front chunk is just that one panel one uh, section on the uh, plot first document. And if you see in the middle of the page here, Barry pockets his phone, and then there's that ping pong we talked about, the back and forth. Farmer says this, Barry says that. Farmer uh, answers him, Barry answers him back. So that takes up like a quarter of this screenplay format page. Whereas on the plot first document, you know, it's like one eighth of the page. 
So there's a lot of economy that happens with the plot first scripting that um, Nicholas and I have been utilizing. So go ahead and play the multiverse of madness video. Um, so Nicholas and I went down to the um, uh, Chicago Museum of Science and Industry to check out the Marvel um, Universe of Superheroes installation down there. And I just thought this was super cool that they have this uh, multiverse of madness thing going on with uh, Doctor Strange. So as this is playing, I'll sort of hit home the idea of collaboration. As a screenwriter, it's super long to work in collaboration with someone is so incredible and so much fun to be able to work on this project. And it really sort of keeps us home. You could know, have a taskmaster like Nicholas make sure that I'm sort of reviewing my ideas, going back. At the same time, we're moving forward. We're both drawing that arrow back and we're moving forward in time. So I just want to thank Nicholas for, um, for being my, you know, being, being sort of being under the cool tutelage of Nicholas Schweitzer has been fun. And I hope, I hope it's good uh, back your way too. But um, yeah, so that's basically my talk today. And, and, uh, I wanted to thank you guys for coming. I apologize to everybody out the blogosphere, but there's a movies here. Encourage the audience here to, to go ahead and Dude. take some of that home to their families for you guys. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure if we're gonna do like an answer question thing online, but I'll open it up to to my people here if, if anybody has a question or you know a comment concern about what's going on with this thing. Yes. Poso, um, Poso. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of dialogue when it comes mm. to your play yeah. scripting for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so like I said, uh, Stan Lee left the dialogue out when he would do his plot first stuff, you know? And if you read some of those early comic books, you can really hear Stan Lee in there because he has sort of like really corny dialogue, you know? And a lot of the times, like in the 60s, 70s, you could really hear his voice in there because he left those word bubbles for later. Like he would fill in. And the whole plot first script idea is that the story is on the page and then you fill in the dialogue later. Now, Nicholas and I have been um, putting the dialogue in as we go through, because we want to make sure that we differentiate between characters. So one character will talk one way and being a singular writer like myself, creating all these characters, I have a tendency to make them all sound the same, you know? And a lot of our characters are, are kids. Like we have a big group of kids as, as our characters and they're all really like precocious kids who are like super intelligent, you know? So it's hard for me to not make them sound all the same. Um, I think like working with you guys in the SLC has really been inspiration for me. Like working with high school age students in the recent past has been a big help for me to just think back about, you know, like how naturalistic can we make this dialogue? Like a contemporary person would be speaking this way or they would not speak like Stan Lee for sure, you know? Um, so yeah, dialogue is super important for us in this process because it's a way for us to talk to each other about the story through the dialogue. And basically, as you can tell by, this, by my presentation today, it's mostly just me talking all the time to Nicholas and him going, okay, that sounds good. Or, you know, like, maybe they could say it this way, you know? Um, but yeah, dialogue is super important. And that, that's one of the things that um, I've been working with uh, Menominee U with, um, just sort of trying to get a concept of how we can introduce more Menominee language into the book, because as it stands right now, it's just sort of like placeholded in there in my mind. 
Like this is a place we could use language. This is a place we could use language. Um, and obviously my dream is that it would be all in Menominee language, you know, I would love for that to be the case, um, but that's not the, the grant project, you know, um, but I can see a future where there would be an entirely Menominee comic book. And then we could do like a side-by-side -side printing with an English language version, you know, and then a Menominee language version. And I'm sure with the talent that's out there now and, and with the, the mentors for Menominee U, like this could be adapted into Menominee language. But as an indigenous person, I feel like that's one of the big things that's a connection. It's an umbilical cord to our past is that language. And like having been a part of the online courses for, uh, for Menominee U, and I apologize to Karabisa that I've been missing class lately. I'm so sorry. I, I will attend again. But um, yeah, I, I feel like it's, the future is wide open for that in the way that the language can be taught with something like this, with a comic book, you know? And I know Annie Wilbur has already done, you know, like a, a kid's book um, meant, meant for the little ones, you know? But so there, there are already examples for us to look to in that way. Anyone else? Yeah. So without giving away the plot, what's the conflict? Uh, the central conflict. So the central conflict, like Nicholas and I, so the the um, let me find the the phrasing I used here. So the catalyst. Right, the catalyst that set our our story in motion. We really look for comps for comparable stories from that we enjoy. So throughout the book, we're going to have references to the Goonies, references to like Firewatch, the video game, uh, references to Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is, is a big theme that's running through it. So without giving the plot away, we're going to pay homage to a lot of those stories and then also tie in, um, you know, like our own experiences in life and stuff. And there have been multiple times already where Nick and I will sit and tell each other like a four or five minute story and then be like, well, then we should just include that into the book, you know? So it's been a really organic process in that way in that we've been mining our own lives, but basically the tentpole structure, I would say is like a Mary Shelley's Frankenstein story and where there's nested narratives within it, there's stories going on within it, but um, yeah. No spoilers, though. Nice try, buddy. Yeah, come back December 3rd. This guy is going to get down on some artwork. Uh, Justin, we do have one question from the chat. Oh, cool. Um, Where'd you get that you? shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, if you could time travel, would you go to the past or the future and why? <laughs> oh man, great question. Awesome question. I think I would go to the past. Yeah, I think I would go to the recent past, like just past the Industrial Revolution. And I would... I think the reason I would do that would be to see what my ancestors saw and sort of live the life that they lived. Because I'm assuming this is like a quantum leap situation where I can't get back, right? I mean, I don't wanna like assume, but I'm imagining it's like you're in the past and you're stuck there, kid. So I would wanna be in the past and check out what's going on with the Menominee Nation back then because I've heard so many stories and, and read so much about it, that would be really interesting to me to be able to, to, uh, to see my community at that, at that time and then bring back some technology in my mind. And probably I would be betting on sports, Biff Tannen style, you know? I'd probably, 
amass a small fortune and then help my tribe out. That's probably what I would do. What is some advice that you would give your younger self, whether it be about writing or life in general? Oh man, don't give up. Like just keep going. And um, I would tell myself that all of the things that you feel like you're wasting time with are all prologue to something. Like a lived life leads to something. It's not just that you're sitting and watching Gilligan's Island. It's like you're learning about stereotypes, tropes. You're learning about story. Um, and also they're never gonna get off that island, dude. <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I feel like at, if I could speak to my younger self, I'd be like, get into school earlier for one, get into secondary education earlier. For two, don't take things so seriously. Life is pretty funny if you let it be funny. Um, bad things are gonna happen. That's just the way things are. I mean, there's a reason it's a comedy and tragedy mask together, you know? And I feel like that's sort of the way life works. I mean, all of us in this room, probably our minds are wandering to the future and what, like, man, there's some bad stuff that I'm gonna have to deal with either today, tomorrow, next year, in the near future, in the next 10 years, stuff is gonna happen. Like bad stuff is gonna happen for all of us. But if we, you know, work together, if we're friends together, we can support each other through through things, you know. Yeah, I, I feel like that's that's another advantage of the collaborative method is that if you're a, an artist and if you're a creative, you know, you don't work in isolation. You sort of do work in isolation, but your product, whatever you come out with, actually you're you're doing that for someone, you know, not just for yourself. Other people can see it too, and other people will experience it too. So I would say all those things to my former self, you know, to my younger self. Don't take don't take things too seriously, and laugh more. Like I'm 45 now, and I'm starting to notice like I'm getting wrinkles, but like I realize those are laugh lines. You know, they're not really wrinkles. Like I've just been laughing so much. So I'm hoping to enjoy life in that way moving forward too, and I hope everyone here does as well, has a great life. Anyone else, anything else? Um, oh, you got a piece of solidarity from an on you. No. Oh. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, let's wrap it up. Thank you guys. Thanks, Blogosphere. Let's get another round of applause for you guys for the in-house in-house audience. Thank you so much.